Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for stopping by. I have two big announcements today. The first is that I've launched my Patreon. I'm going to be honest, I've been quite reluctant to launch it, and it's been sitting there for months without completion. But, as a lot of you guys have expressed a desire to help support the channel, and given the state that YouTube is currently in by stripping away monetization from horror channels like mine, it would really be a tremendous help. So, if you can, or want, follow the link in the description to find out more. But please don't feel obligated. The second announcement is that I am finally going to launch merch. It takes some time to come up with ideas, designs and such, and I hope that you'll like them when they're released in the next week or two. I'll be sure to let you know, so keep an eye out. But without further ado, the demons and ghosts are waiting, so get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I worked at a hospital, doing transport for a couple of years. The transport home base was in the basement of a hospital, where all the laundry was done, as well as supplies being sorted there. I hated working there, since after the incident I'm about to tell you. On this particular night, I was the only one in the basement, when I heard whistling at the end of the hallway by the elevator. I poked my head around the corner, fully expecting to see my only co-worker on duty that night. But there was absolutely no one there. I shrugged it off. I'm not easily spooked, and nights are always slow. So I sat back, chilled in the break room for a little while and ate some snacks. Next thing I know though, I hear a loud bang. I walked into the hallway and a bed was rolling down the hall, bumping into the sides. It was very creepy, and at this point I seriously think my co-worker is trying to bullshit me. So I radio him and ask him where he is. He tells me that he's in the cafeteria on the top floor of the building. Ah, I still don't believe him. He must be playing a joke, and I'm convinced I will catch him in the act. A few minutes later, I walk past the laundry room, and the moment I pass, I hear the machine start up. I poke my head in, and I don't see him at all in that room. I've got to admit, I was starting to get a little nervous. So then I walk into the laundry room, and the moment that both my feet step foot in there, all the machines simultaneously stop. I freeze, and then run out and head towards the elevator, and that's when I hear the whistling again. At this point, I know I am the only worker in the basement. As I am standing there waiting for the elevator, Things start falling off the shelf down the hall. Boxes of gloves, tissues, packages of tubes. I am literally standing there and watching them all fall off one by one at the opposite end of the hallway. I shit you not. My entire body broke out in goosebumps. My hair stood on the end and I had a strong gut feeling that I was being watched. I know, I was not alone. As I'm getting onto the elevator, I feel what feels like someone brushing my arm. I went upstairs and found my co-worker still in the cafeteria. I freaked out to him and got out of there as quickly as I could and transferred soon after that. The creepy thing to add to it all is that I whistle mindlessly to myself whilst I'm working and it's almost as if the spirit that was there was trying to mimic me. Creepiest feeling ever. 
My first apartment was very haunted. I have no other explanation. It was just a little apartment, with four bedrooms and a living room, and a kitchen in the middle, intended for college kids to live in. It was a bit off campus, and right next to a gigantic cemetery, which probably accounts for all the activity. There were two main ghosts, if you want to call them that, that is. We ended up just referring to them as the masculine and the feminine one. The main event that ticked off the activity was one night, we were all hanging in our rooms and most with our doors closed. I remember hearing what sounded like two people talking. One voice was light and feminine, and the other was lower and much more masculine. It was coming from the main kitchen area. They had a long conversation from the way it sounded. At first I thought it was a roommate with a girl he may have brought over, but after a while, I realised that it wasn't anything like his voice. I creaked open the door, and the moment I did, the talking stopped mid-sentence. Not long after, my roommate came from his door across the hall, as he said that he heard it too, and we just kind of looked at each other for a bit, and decided to go for a walk, because it was very creepy. This event set off a chain reaction of weird shit. Another night, it sounded like something punched the wall as hard as it could in the kitchen, after some jumbled speaking. Literally, blah blah BAM, and it reverberated around the whole kitchen. It scared the shit out of us especially because we were about to go to sleep. You would hear talking from another room on occasion, just weird mumbles and the like. Sometimes there would be more than one voice. You would always see shadows moving at the peripheries of your vision. More than once, we saw full form figures. My friend at the time and roommate moved out after he saw something dark and human shaped in his Skype window through his webcam, standing in his doorway. This was a short while before I left his room. Once, there was one just standing in a friend's room whilst he was away. I just ignored it and went into my room and locked the door. I think I had some shock going on. You felt like you were being watched quite often, footsteps all the time ranging from soft to hard. One time, it was around 9 o'clock, and I kept hearing someone walking on the grass outside the building back and forth, whilst the window was open. The unmistakable swish swish of shoes on grass. At first I thought it was another tenant, but after a while, I looked and there was no one there. And yet I could still hear someone walking back and forth along the side of the building. What made it even freakier still, was that I was the only one living there at the time, and the units were mostly empty, because it was summer. My friend had a baking sheet thrown at him. It flew from the top of the fridge where we kept our pans, right at his head as he was cooking. This did happen after he was trying to communicate with the ghosts, taunting it as it were. It wasn't uncommon to have things like keys, cups, etc. knocked off the counters, or things having moved from their own accord. But the greatest and freakiest experience of all was that the first Christmas that I lived there, I'd gone home for break, and we had all left around the same time. We had locked the place up, and we had left. We turned off all the lights, and locked every door and latched every window. 
Whilst at home though, there was this video card that I had left up in my apartment. My friend wanted to take a look at it, and we thought we could fix it for him. So we drove the hour long drive back to my apartment to pick it up. When we got there, the place had the worst feeling I've ever experienced. It just felt like a pressure walking into the building. All the lights were on, and my friend's computer was playing a movie. That part freaked me out the most, because he had locked the door to his room and shut his computer down. Not only that, he had this stupid long password that none of us knew. I immediately thought that someone had broken in. I grabbed a knife and we cleared room to room. I had to jimmy open my friend's room that had the computer playing a movie, but there was no one there. No sign of forced entry. All the windows were locked. Wanting to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible, I chalked it up to just the apartment being weird, and we decided to both use the bathroom and then get the hell out of there with the video card. As I'm looking for the card, my friend just shouts, Holy shit! from the bathroom, and comes out pure white, pants still unbuttoned. He said, as he was peeing, something whispered in his ear from the shower. He couldn't make out what it was saying, but it was a feminine voice. He never believed me, every time I told him this place was haunted. He didn't doubt me after that and it took him a long time before he ever came back to visit the apartment. Finally, all the weird shit came to a head. It would go through phases, where there would be relatively quiet for a while, and then batshit crazy for about a month. This particular cycle was pretty bad, and my friends and roommates were getting quite bothered by it. He went to the landlady to complain, and maybe to get us out of contract. And she said, and I quote, Oh, don't worry. We've had a lot of complaints about that in the past, but no one's ever gotten hurt. At the time, I was an atheist. But that situation really forced me to change my mind on ghosts and the afterlife. I really felt like at times, something was trying to talk to us. And at times, Something was just trying to troll us. It really messed us all up, especially my friend. He underwent a severe personality change and we don't even talk anymore. And as lame as the TV shows make it out to be, I really got into ghost hunting after this. Especially because I had so many first-hand crazy experiences. I think it's something that we just can't prove yet. Death is something beyond what we can quantify to the best of our abilities. This story is about my aunt. She was the loveliest woman that you could ever meet, and was a big influence in my life when I was growing up. I don't know how all of this started, but out of nowhere one day she just went crazy. Let me give you a bit of background. I am a 6 foot 2, rather fit man. I practice Aikido and can bench press 240. My father and his brothers are pretty much as tall as I am, maybe less strong due to age though, and most of them have been practicing fighting sports for a long time. My aunt, by contrast, is about 5 foot 2, and probably weighs about 110 pounds at best. She would get incredibly angry and out of control at random times, spitting nonsense words, and there would be absolutely no way my father or I, or even together, would be able to get her down. It felt like Dragon Ball Z Yamcha trying to get Perfect Cell into a UFC submission. She had about 10 times my strength. We needed to be four to actually pin her down and get her to stop moving until she calmed down. This was extremely scary, as she would just switch without warning, which was so out of character for her. 
I didn't believe in the supernatural, but my grandmother, a traditional Moroccan woman, was convinced that she was possessed. And honestly, it really felt like it. For those of you who don't know, Morocco has a pretty big culture surrounding the supernatural, sorcery, possessions and exorcisms, so most of the elders in the family firmly believe in it. However, at the time, the rest of my family were not buying it. We took her to the hospital and had some extensive tests done on her, because we thought that she must be suffering from some kind of seizures. But everything came back negative. Someone even recommended a psychiatrist and although we took her there, it was of no help whatsoever. We were all becoming very concerned. So fast forward a few months later, and it was becoming way too difficult for us to handle. My uncle contacted a good friend in Morocco, who was an exorcist in his family. He asked us to do one very strange thing. He asked my aunt if she could put a drop of blood into a glass of water, and leave the glass somewhere in the apartment while she slept, but just no way near her, so that she didn't get up and drink it while she was sleeping. We were reluctant, but my grandmother insisted on her doing it. On the morning, the glass was empty. I personally am still convinced she just woke up and drank it, but in the exorcist version, she was possessed by a demon, commonly known in our culture as a jinn. Giving him blood was just a way for you to welcome him and calm him down temporarily, and she needed to see an exorcist ASAP. Now we were getting convinced that he was right, seeing her often becoming crazier and crazier. In desperate times, sometimes you just choose to believe in a possible solution. So at this point, I decided to believe in what he said, and we had to get proof that he was right. We lived in France, and we decided to drive down to Morocco, which was a 1,500 kilometer drive, with a six hour boat ride, and then another 500 kilometers driving when we got to Morocco. During the drive, I have never been as scared as I am to this day. I was sitting in the back, my auntie in the middle and my dad on the other side. She went crazy at some point. We couldn't hold her down and she was trying to hit my uncle whilst he was driving. We nearly smashed into a wall, and my father had to dangerously choke her until she lost some strength. I know it sounds horrible, but she really was beyond it. So anyway, here we are in Morocco, getting to this village named Seferu, known as one of the biggest places in the country where sorcery happens. It's a rather creepy place, and not in a conventional creepy way either. What we all know of creeps are just what horror movies puts into picture, but the African creepy is on another level. We get to meet this exorcist guy, and he asks us to buy a sheep to sacrifice, and tells us that we should bring him the sheep's guts back for the exorcism to happen. My father and uncle take care of this, as I am absolutely petrified. As I stated earlier, I didn't believe in this. I decided to because honestly the situation called for it. But at this point, in a freaky spooky village in the middle of Morocco, we were advised to never eat anything outside or accept anything from a stranger who might try and curse us. Where everything looked twisted as hell. I was losing it. And really could not wait to leave this place forever. On the following day, we went to the exorcist's house and brought him these guts. He put them into a bowl and asked me if we were feeling strong enough to stay, as more people around would make it easier to exorcise. Well, I really wanted to leave, but seeing as everyone was staying, I stayed as well. My aunt was lying down in front of us next to the bowl, and we were sitting down around her, holding hands, and the exorcist started saying stuff in a dialect that I couldn't understand. 
he gets sweaty and begins speaking faster and I see my aunt twitching in what looks like pain. And then all of a sudden, all the lights went out. Holy shit, I think I peed my pants at this moment. The exorcist screamed something and then my aunt screamed as well and we were in total silence in the dark. I think the silence lasted for about 30 seconds, but honestly, it felt like hours. The exorcist assistant then came in with a lamp, and what we see is that both him and my aunt are passed out. The bowl is on the floor, and the guts are next to it. The guts had turned black. I'm not joking, they were red before the lights went out, and then they were black, as if they'd been singed beyond belief. I have goosebumps just remembering that and trying to picture it. The assistant urges us not to touch the guts at any cost. The exorcist wakes up and goes to put some water on his face, and then tells us to follow him. We went to a nearby empty hill, and when we reached the top, he asked us to burn the guts right then and there, as the demon was now possessing the sheep, and we could get rid of it. And that's exactly what we did. Since that day, my aunt has never shown any problems whatsoever. Her crisis period never happened again. Trying to remember this honestly scares the crap out of me. Just seeing her now gives me the chills even though she is back to being the loveliest person I know. I am just so glad though, that she is back to the way she was. My mother, my daughter and I, live together in the United States. It's generally a nice set of apartments here, but like in any neighbourhood, there are a few bad seeds, but for the most part, there are just ordinary, hard-working good people. I do have some stories to tell about the upstairs neighbour. That guy was a crazy drug dealer. But this story is about my daughter's experience. During the following events, she was only three years old, and my job would require me to work the night shift as an inventory manager. So consequently, my mother would look after my daughter and drop her off at daycare in the morning, as of course, I would barely just be getting home. There would occasionally be rare times where I would finish work early and get to see her more, as well as the days I took off to spend more time with her. It was on a night where I was working that was the genesis of the events that followed. I was in my office when suddenly, my cell phone begins to ring. I look down to see it's my mother, and I pick up immediately. I could tell that something was off. Her voice sounded worried, and she was telling me that she could hear wailing coming from a neighbor's house. And shortly after, there were several cop cars and an ambulance parked outside. She couldn't see anything, but there was a palpable feeling of dread that loomed in the air. It wasn't until next morning that we saw on the news that a woman living on the same complex as us was stabbed to death by her ex-boyfriend yesterday. As tragic as that was, I had no idea that the incident would affect my family in the way it did. Now, I need to describe the layout of the apartment, as it is important to understand the story. If you look down the hallway from my mother's room, you can see into the kitchen and the open living room, and from there, you can also see into my room. As time went by, my mother and I would notice that my daughter would act a little strange from time to time. She never wanted to be left alone, and would regularly stare at empty spaces 
as if she was zoned out staring at something. Not only that, she seemed to get scared for no apparent reason. We'd always ask her if she were okay, and she'd say that she was fine. I was off from work one day a few weeks later, and after playing some games with my daughter, I noticed that she looked pretty tired. So I put on a movie for her in my mother's room, as I washed the dishes to lull her into a nap. I went down the hallway into the kitchen to start washing the dishes, and after a few minutes, I see her walking down the hallway. I thought she was going to ask for a snack, but she passed me with her head tilted, as if she were following something into the living room, then into our room. Perplexed, I stopped what I was doing, and I walked out of the kitchen into the living room. I called her name softly, but she didn't respond, and stood for a few moments in the front of our room, staring intently at the emptiness. I was getting a little bit concerned. It was almost as if she were in a trance of some kind, when then suddenly, she turns back and crawled to me so that I could pick her up. I asked her what was wrong, and what she was looking at, but she just stared back at me with a scared look on her face, staring into the empty abyss of the room. I was bewildered, and after I calmed her down and put her to bed, I told my mother about the incident. A few weeks passed, and it was a night that I would have to work, so before I left, I prepared some dinner and snacks for her, as well as set up a movie in the living room for the evening. As I was doing this, she was in her playpen. I had a little time to spare before I left work, and was a little tired, so I sat on the sofa and put a blanket on me to relax for a few minutes before I left. I was just at the point of nodding off, when I heard her footsteps from behind me, as she called out to me. Mummy? Hmm? I replied whilst keeping my eyes closed. Go. Away. She said in a very soft but serious tone. I was confused. I opened my eyes to see her facing away with her back towards me. Go. Away. She repeated herself. I was half asleep and confused. It was as if she was talking to nothing, but before I could fully comprehend the situation, she hurried over under the covers with me on the couch. I held her tightly until we fell asleep in each other's embrace. Next night at work, I mulled over everything. I was getting concerned and putting together the events that had transpired when I got hit by a strong urge to call my mother. I can't describe it, but I picked up the phone and asked her to burn some sage in her room before she went to bed. As the nights that I'm away, she will sleep with her. A few hours later, at 5am, I get a call from my mother. She is manic and telling me to get home now. I rush home and see her and my daughter crying outside. I ask them what's going on, and my mother tells me that she is not stepping foot into the house until it's cleansed. She tells me that she forgot to burn the sage, and that that night, she had a dream that she was walking down the hallway to the kitchen, and realised she had no idea why she was going there in the first place. So she turned around to go back to her room, but there was something keeping her from opening the door. She wasn't sure what it was, but it filled her with pure dread and felt her stomach drop as she remembered that my daughter was still in the room. It was at that very moment 
she woke up because my daughter was screaming bloody murder. I entered the apartment and started burning sage. I stated out loud, I think I know who you are, and I'm sorry about your death, but my daughter is only three years old and you are scaring her. Please, stop. You need to move on. After that, my daughter never acted strange again. I'm convinced that the poor woman who was murdered was clinging onto this world. But I'm not sure why she fixated on my daughter. I hope she found her peace. I was 24 and working at a very old hospital in a large midwestern city near where I had grown up. I did choose a career in the healthcare industry, despite my experiences because I really do love helping people. I didn't become a doctor or nurse though, despite my love and interest in the medical field, as I am rather squeamish. So, one month, we had to do a complete inventory and overhaul of medical records. Our hospital was finally getting on board with electronic records, so that meant a shit ton of work to do. We had to sort out records so that they could be destroyed by our contractor, as we couldn't legally do this on site. Records to keep and organise, and getting them ready to put into the electronic system, i.e. type them in manually. So that meant that we would have to work our shifts, usually, at night, in the basement, for 11 hours. Now, a hospital basement is creepy enough during the day. It's where the morgue is and usually where they transport the dead bodies. It's not like you can move them around upstairs in front of people. This particular part of the hospital had many stories of hauntings. But for the most part, I tried to ignore them. I have a bit of a reputation for being a bit hard to scare. So there's this one guy who works at us as a night custodian whose main goal in life seemed to be to scare the pants off me and every other girl working that shift. His name was Lewis, and he was forever trying to frighten me. So this night, as we're working away, we all hear bangs coming from across the corridor. We just assume it's Lewis, up to some practical jokes, as well as heavy footsteps outside the doors and clanking noises occasionally. We had a lot of work to do, so despite the noises we would always just tell Lewis to be quiet and please shut up because we were seriously trying to get this done. So near the end of the night, at around 3am, it was just me and one other girl. She asked if I'd be okay by myself because she had to go home to look after her baby. I told her that I'd be fine and that she could leave. I was alright until about 3.20 anyway. Then the footsteps went from the hallway to the other side of the room. And the banging noises turned into someone banging on the cabinets. I also felt very strongly that I was being watched. These were old filing cabinets that had long heavy drawers, so they were all metal. So you know what it sounds like when someone bangs on a metal object. Loud as hell. I kept yelling to Lewis that it wasn't funny, but the sounds kept on intensifying, close to the point that I started hearing heavy breathing behind me. I may have looked calm, but on the inside, I was terrified. I just didn't want to give whoever it was the satisfaction of knowing that I was scared. I just tried to ignore it and continued with my work. It seemed to be aware that I was going to ignore it. So it upped the ante. It would brush by my hair and touch my back and shoulders. I must have gasped or made a noise when it touched my back because it laughed right in my ear. It was a cruel and almost sinister laugh. 
I didn't even turn around and I just shouted for it to leave me alone. I stopped working and went upstairs for the night. No way I was sticking around there after that. I came back to work two days later and found out that Lewis hadn't even been in the building and that he had been on holiday the whole time. I think I always knew that the thing in the room wasn't him. He had never been that creepy. A few weeks later, I was talking with some older staff that had been working there for a long time. They told me that they don't like going into the basement at night because it has a reputation. A reputation for the strange noises that happen inexplicably. I was around 17 on a solo trip to London. Late one night, I was meeting a friend at Finsbury Park tube station when some kids started harassing me. I walked out of the tube and made a right onto Seven Sisters Road, then another right hoping to go around another tube entrance where I could call my friend to avoid these teenagers. As I was walking down Forth Hill Road, I passed a guy who was really tall and blonde. He was incredibly pale, wearing a long black Victorian style duster coat, with the collar pulled up over the lower half of his face. I thought it was strange, but kept walking thinking it was some goth guy who had come out of the Sir George Roby or something. When I turned right again onto Goodwin Street, I realised his footsteps weren't receding but keeping pace with my own. I turned around and noticed that the guy had come around the corner and was about a quarter of a block behind me, so I kept walking until I realised that the street ended with a dead end. Shit. So I mustered my courage to fight off this creep and turn around and go back the way I came. And the guy is gone. I look around and there's no doorways. No alleys. Nowhere. Nowhere that I could see that he might have gone. I go back down to Font Hill Road, and I look up and down the street. Nothing. He's just vanished into thin air. I pulled my coat closer, ran back to the tube, and hustled myself back to my hostel. When I later told my friend about the night, he teased me that it must have been spring Jack, and I'm not so sure that it wasn't. My family used to own and run a real estate office. My grandfather owned it and was the boss, and my mother managed the rent roll and the clients. I worked there on weekends as a teenager. We worked in a very multicultural area, which I always loved, and there was always a reasonable Maui Islander community there and a lot of whom were very religious. In one particular property we managed, there was this one family who had two sons. One of them played football with my younger brother, and the other is the subject of this incident. So this kid was 11, I think, and according to the family, was beginning to act strangely. He would have violent outbursts and say terrible, terrible things. Apparently he was seriously out of control, and the family called their Baptist minister and asked what they should do. Was there even anything that they could do? The minister told them that he was free one evening later that week, and that he would bring the things needed for a baptism. He said that he would perform an exorcism for them. As a good spiritual leader, Good religious people and a baptism could oust an evil spirit. The evening arrived and the minister got all set up. He got into this deep tub that they all filled with water for the baptism. He chose some passages from the Bible that would help with the exorcism and got the whole family together around to support and pray. Now, islander families tend to be large. There were aunts, uncles, cousins and grandparents. Everyone was there and willing to help this child. The parents are instructed to bring out the kid, so the father goes to get him. 
but the kid was an absolute catastrophe. He was described as being like the Tasmanian devil from the cartoons, just all over the place. His dad put the boy over his shoulders and brought him down to where everyone was standing. The kid fighting every step, but with his father being an absolutely enormous man, he didn't stand a chance. The minister said for everyone to gather around and put their hands on the child and pray for him. The father held him in the middle of the family group, and everyone reached out their hands to touch the boy who was thrashing around like a wild thing. What I heard was that it seemed like the boy was totally out of control. Time comes for the minister to say whatever he said, and then for them to get him into the tub for the baptism, which was supposed to expel the demon they figured was possessing him. The father and uncle or something were the ones who got him in the tub, and the family stood around praying their hearts out. But the boy tried to escape the second his body hit the water. He put up a crazy fight, and more family members came in to get him into the water. Finally, they got him in, and were able to hold him there. And hold him, and hold him, and hold him. They didn't mean to do it, but they drowned him. He was an 11 year old boy on the cusp of puberty. Of course his behaviour was erratic, of course his attitude was awful, of course he fought being held down by his own family. What did they think was going to happen? The parents, uncle and minister all got arrested. The uncle got off as an accessory charge, the parents got 10 years but were out sooner and the minister got 15 and was in for the whole time because he was the leader. He should have known better. My mum had to go back and talk to the police and be a character witness about the family and the property and whatnot. Obviously, as we didn't know them all that well, we can hardly talk about the kid and whether he was possessed or not. But I can tell you that it was probably the saddest thing I've ever heard. And even if he was possessed, he didn't deserve for that to happen to him. I worked overnight security in one of the largest, best and oldest hospitals in the US. My fellow security officers and I all have stories about one building in particular. But the one that I tell is one that only happened to me. Backstory for the building. It was built in the late 1800s and it was originally a psychiatric building for this hospital. Now. Being the late 1800s, not much was known about psychiatric disorders, and on top of that, this hospital was known for its medical research. With both of those facts combined, you can infer that some terrible things were done in the walls of these buildings. A couple of years before I started working security there, this building had been converted into offices after the newly built part of the hospital dedicated a section for an updated psych ward. So anyway, my rounds for the night happened to include this building. At night, this building was empty. Due to it being recently converted into offices and the drones who worked there wanting to leave promptly at five if not earlier. In some of their haste, they left their office doors unlocked, which is a big no-no due to the medical information being located in their offices. It was our duty to go to each floor and to make sure that every door was locked, and if it wasn't, to secure it ourselves. I did my initial sweep of the building to make sure it was clear, and nobody was in the building. I proceeded to do my door-to-door -door checks, and the hallways were pretty narrow, so I could check both sides of the hallway doors at once. At the end of this hallway, there were two sets of doors that you had to go through to reach the final office. 
which was a dead end. Everything was secure. Awesome. Time for the next floor. I exited the two sets of doors from the dead end office and stood absolutely frozen from what I saw. Every door ajar, set perfectly, so their own weight wouldn't cause them to shut again, and one wheelchair at the end of said hallway, facing towards the steps. I had heard other security officers outright reject that set of rounds due to strange stuff happening there, but I laughed it off until that night. I never took those rounds again. I worked as a security attendant in an apartment building. It's 24 stories and is one of the oldest buildings in my city. One night, I'm sitting here when the phone rings about 3am. I answer. Hello, this is D'Artagnan at the front desk. How can I help you? The voice on the other end sounds female, but was totally garbled, and the only bit that I could make out was 23rd floor. I tried to tell the person that I couldn't understand them, and asked which apartment they were in, but again, they garbled a response saying 23rd floor. I said, since I can't understand you, I'll come and meet you in the hallway. So I go to the main elevators, and both of them, surprise surprise, are on the 23rd floor. Luckily for me, we have an old service elevator, and it's only on the 7th floor. I get in, and I hit the button for the 23rd floor. But it won't move, and the inner door will not close. So I go to unlock the reset panel, and boom, we start going up with the door still open. I'm freaking out and the elevator is shaking because it goes pretty fast and it's quite old. As I'm going up, I just stay towards the back and finally, I reach floor 23. I step out, door closes just fine and I look around the hallway. There's no one here. I walk along slowly trying to listen for anyone who might be awake that's called, but there's nothing. So now I head in the opposite direction and go towards where the regular elevators are. And when I get to them, they're just sitting there with their doors open. I was pretty freaked out, but I knew the elevators could just be on the fritz. So I get in, and figure I'll just reset them when I get to the first floor. That's when, I hear the sound of the back stairwell closing. So I quickly get out and go to the stairwell. But lo and behold, there's no one there. But the maintenance door to the machine room is ajar. And at that time, I was the only one in the building with a key. See, at the top of the building is a large machine room for housing all the really, really loud machinery that does stuff in the building and allows access to the roof. I don't really like going in there because it's creepy as hell and no one ever goes in there. So at this point, I'm pretty seriously freaked. But I muster up the courage and head in. I shout hello, and there's no response. The lights in the room flicker, because they're crappy fluorescent lights, so I can't see that well either. But at the end of the room, I can make out the roof access door, and sure as shit, it's slightly open. So I slowly continue forwards checking the space between each machine as I walk by, and there's no one there. So I open the door to the access roof, and I can't see anyone ahead of me on the roof, but there is a slight wrap around, and if there was a jumper or something I needed to be sure, 
so I stepped out and leave the door ajar like it was. Almost immediately though, the door is pulled shut. Now I might have written off as the wind or something, but this door is hard to shut. Really hard. I immediately grab the handle and yank it open, slam it behind me and run straight for the maintenance door. It automatically locks when it's closed, so I slam it shut too and go back down to the 23rd floor hallway. I get into an elevator and the door is still open and I go all the way down to the first floor. I go back to the main lobby and as soon as I sit down, the phone rings. I pick it up and don't say a word. And sure as hell, garbled voice again audibly says, 23rd floor. I hung up the phone, turned the ringer off and spent the rest of the evening just staring at the parking garage security monitor. We live in a very old house. I've lived here since I was four. I'm 22 now. A lot of odd things have happened here. The main one being that I woke up in the very early hours of the morning to see a young boy messing with the sink that I had in my room at the time. He wasn't looking at me and he seemed almost not there, but I could see him. When I managed to pluck up the courage and go ask to see my parents, I left him in my room. My parents were very understanding. Turns out that years later, when they told my sister and I that we had spirits in the house, I described this lad to them, and they said that they'd seen him and they knew that I wasn't making it up. There was always singing in the house too. Never an actual source, just humming and singing, floating around the house. My sister and mother would always have things go missing, but they'd always turn up in the attic or a room that we frequently used. For example, my mum was going in and out of a room and on her return, her diary, which had gone missing a few days earlier, was sitting on the middle of the floor, despite the fact that it was not there moments earlier. A lot of these I was too young to understand but when my parents sat us down and told us everything, it scared the shit out of me for a good while. We still have random unexplained things that happen to us, but we talk about it and just wonder who or what it might be. I've never known what to make of this. The high school I went to was a very religious private school. In the senior year, it was a tradition for the entire senior class to go on a religious retreat up into this remote resort in the mountains with a few of the teachers. The point of the retreat was to grow closer to each other and to also find God and perhaps experience spirituality. But at any case, they took our phones and forbade us from using any form of internet or communication with the outside world. Then they would make us go through a series of soul-bearing exercises and speeches and whatnot. Honestly, pretty cheesy stuff. Not that exciting. On the third day of the retreat, however, the entire grade is in the main hall doing an hour of silent prayer that was pretty much like meditation, but we were supposed to be communicating with God. All of a sudden, there's a huge crash, and everyone looks over to see a girl toppled over on the floor. As everyone stares, she starts writhing around on the ground and screaming, but not screaming like pain. The voice that she was screaming was a really strange deep voice, and didn't sound like her at all. Someone yelled, she's seizing! I remember that because there was a girl in our class who was known to have epileptic seizures and she would do it in assembly pretty frequently, but it wasn't the same girl. Then she stood up and started yelling in tongues, 
Her eyes were rolled up and her head kept twitching back and forth. She started to run around the room, yelling in an unintelligible gibberish language. And every now and then she would run at the cross in the middle of the room and then run back screaming and crying. At first, I honestly thought it was a dumb high school prank to freak everyone out. But if it was that, she took it way too far. The teachers tried to calm her down, but she just kept screaming in this weird language. She started pulling out some of her hair, and one of the teachers had to call an ambulance, but we knew that it would take them hours to arrive to get to this remote retreat. Another teacher tried to take her by the shoulders, and she dug her nails into his arms really hard and just kept screaming. It took several more minutes to calm her down. The teachers actually evacuated us from the room, and then she just... went quiet. They took that girl away that night, though I don't know how or where they were kept because we were in the cafeteria after all of that. She never came back to school after the retreat was over. I wasn't friends with her friends, so I don't know if they knew what really happened. She was probably expelled for what happened, but maybe not. If it was a prank, it went on for way too long, but it was damn convincing if it was. She didn't seem like the kind of girl who would ever be up for anything like that, which is what strikes me as well. None of the teachers were allowed to talk about it when we asked afterwards. I just hoped that she was okay afterwards. When I was around four years old, I moved into a house in the middle of a park owned by the city that we lived in at the time. The agreement was that we could live in the house for free, all utilities included, other than cable. If we took care of the park, I lived in this house for nearly nine years, and at first the place was amazing. About four years after we moved in though, some shit happened. My great grandmother was diagnosed with colon cancer, very much developed. There was no way she was going to make it, even if they cut out what they could of the cancer. At the time of this, I was in grade four and had gotten pretty into ghosts. So one night in May, I was sleeping. Around this time, my brother was three and had somehow managed to get my parents to sleep on the couches in our living room down the hall. They were always up really late watching TV. So I'd have my bedroom door, which was at the other end of the hall, open, so I could see if the TV was on when I woke up. Around two or three in the morning, I awake, and the first thing I saw was a little girl laying down in the corner of the bedroom near the closet. She looked to be around seven or eight, with a little white skirt and pigtails. It took me about two minutes to register what the hell I was looking at, and it scared the absolute shit out of me. I jumped out of my bed and ran down the hall to tell my parents, and just as I got to the door, she vanished. So I went and told my parents, and they told me that I was dreaming and to go back to bed. I did. I fell asleep pretty quickly, but woke up not 20 minutes later, and when I looked at the door, there she was again. I did the same thing, and she disappeared as soon as I reached the door. After I told my parents that it happened again, they told me to go back to bed. So I did, and somehow managed to sleep without incident. Then about a month after, my great-grandmother passed away from the aforementioned cancer. Fast forward a few weeks after her death, I had gotten into the habit of going into the living room where my parents now slept on an air mattress. Whilst we were trying to sleep, I looked down the hall. I could barely see around the corner from the couch, but I could see a little bit. While I was sitting there, I saw something move and look around the corner. 
It was a short shape, just barely taller than the other couch that we had. But I saw it, staring at me. And if that wasn't enough, it began walking. It walked over around the couch and past me. It was a pure dark shape. No facial features, no clothes, nothing. It was just the shape of a human child. And I swear to God, it looked right at me. And as it walked past the couch I was on, it disappeared. But then more childlike figures began walking past me. At least ten more of the same ones. After the last one, I had had enough. I was scared shitless. So I got off the couch and crawled over to the air mattress to let my parents know. Whilst doing this though, I looked up at the corner to see a figure looking at me from behind it. It was a lot taller than the others, but the key differences were I could see the outline of curly hair on its head. I could feel whatever it was was staring right into me. I began crying hysterically, and when my dad woke up, the figure was gone. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. Since the next day was Saturday, I was able to contemplate the figures that I'd seen. The last figure with curly hair actually began to seem familiar, and then I put it together. The figure I had seen was that of my great-grandmother. It looked exactly like her from the short, stocky build to the curly hair. And as for the kids, it took me a bit longer. If you want to learn about the park, the park is Merkley Park. There's a high school there, right next to the park. And around 1890, it had been an elementary school, which ended up burning down. A few kids did die in the fire, and that's where I realised where the figures came from. Once I moved, the scariest thing to happen was a few nights after we moved in. I woke up because something had slapped me in the face. No one was in my room when I looked, and I still cannot explain it. I was helping another nurse with a patient that had lived a very hard life. He had numerous things going on, from cardiac to renal failure. You name it, he had it going on. This man was very much afraid to die. He never told anyone why, but I suppose everyone's afraid to die really. Every time his heart monitor beeped, he would just go into a raging scream. Don't let me die! Don't let me die! He clearly wasn't ready to go. At 2am, his cardiac monitor starts alarming VTAC. We both rush into the room, and I am pulling the crash cart behind me. When I get to the room, the other nurse is completely white. This man was sitting about two inches above the bed and was laughing. His whole look had completely changed. His eyes had a look of pure evil on them and he had the most malicious grin on his face. He laughed at us and said, You stupid cows aren't going to let me die, are you? And then he laughed again. We were kind of frozen. I did reach up and hit the code blue button, and when I did, the man went into V-fib. He crashed back on the bed and we started coding him, but after 20 minutes it was called. Five minutes after the code was called, several of the cleaning team were in there doing their business, when the man sits up straight in bed and says, You let him die too bad, and then begins laughing maniacally. The man collapsed back into the bed, and then we heard the most horrible, 
agonizing scream resonate through the hallways. You could hear, don't let me die, be whispered throughout the whole unit. Every one of the nurses that night was pale and scared. Nobody went anywhere by themselves. By morning, though, the whispering had subsided. The night shift nurses had a prayer service in the break room before we left for home. But still, we all had nightmares for weeks. I used to work as a machine operator for a factory doing the graveyard shift. It was only me on the floor and a supervisor in the office, and for the most part, it was always a two-man shift. Sometimes, he would come to help me bring stock materials from the back. You see, the back storage room was haunted, or so I was told by the previous shift worker that I replaced. I'm not superstitious, and was sceptical about what I was told. And for the first week, nothing unnatural happened, which of course only reinforced my scepticism. However, as time went by, I started to notice that the machines closest to the storage room entrance would turn on by themselves randomly. Not to mention that I started to hear people talking in the back storage room whilst I was passing. As I mentioned, it was only me and my supervisor on that shift. And when I or we would go to investigate after hearing, we would find everything dark and silent. The time that crowns all instances though, happened a few months later. My supervisor had just finished helping me with the task and he told me that he would be in the office if I needed him. I'm carrying on with my work, when about 20 minutes later, I hear a colossal crashing noise from the back storage room. It scared the shit out of me. At first, I assumed that it must have been him in the back room, and that he crashed the forklift into the wall. But when I went to call him, he was already walking towards me and demanded to know what the noise was, because he was in his office at the time and assumed it was me. I told him that I had been in there the whole time, and that I thought it had been him who had made the noise. We were both visibly shaken, and mutually agreed to check it out. Like previous instances, the back storage lights were off and it was eerie quiet. We turned the lights on and then we saw barrels toppled over and a broken crate with stock materials all over the ground. These crates are on shelves about five feet off the ground and the barrels are completely full and very difficult to move. We cleaned it up and he used a forklift to put the replacement crate with the materials back on the shelf. In the time it took us to fix up the mess, it was lunch break. He went out to get food, and I was alone operating the machines again, in this big factory, the size of two football fields. I wasn't troubled or scared knowing that he would be back in about half an hour, but as the minutes ticked by, I kept hearing something. It sounded like a woman whispering, and it was coming directly from the dark back room. I tried putting it off, and thinking that it was in my head. And then, I heard something. It sounded like a barrel had fallen down again by itself. I need to clarify, these barrels are very, very heavy and they cannot fall down independently without a great deal of force pushing them. When I went to investigate, I saw a barrel in the middle of the room, and I booked it out of there. When he got back, he asked me what I was doing outside, and I told him that I kept hearing some strange whispering from the dark room, and when I went to investigate, I found a barrel had managed to roll itself to the middle of the room, and that it had utterly terrified me. 
He didn't believe me and thought that I was playing a practical joke on him. But the security camera, however, verified that the barrel just rolled out by itself from the dark storage area, which defies explanation. You can also clearly see me coming into view to check out where the barrel came from and hurried back after turning off the machines. This prompted management to abolish the graveyard shift and I quit shortly after. When I was 14, my best friend and I decided to use a Ouija board. We got into a dark room in my house and lit some candles and started the game. Another friend of ours knocked on our door when we tried to contact the spirits. We let her in and resumed. This third person kept mocking us as we tried to get the supernatural messages. When all of a sudden, she passed out. We thought she was joking, but then she opened her eyes and began speaking in a voice that wasn't her own. It was very deep and guttural and damn scary but we still thought that she could just be playing with us. She then laughed, a really horrible laugh, and started to say things that had happened to me, things that I had never told anyone before, and she did the same for my best friend. The candle started to flicker, and she began speaking gibberish. I couldn't even understand what was coming out of her mouth. We were absolutely terrified. This started off as a simple joke game, I thought, and then it got seriously out of hand. My friend then ran over to my neighbour's house. She was a very devout woman. And then she ran over to see our friend. She gasped and told us to bring her to her house. We grabbed onto her arm and she fought us the whole way there, starting to scratch us and trying to get undressed. It was seriously freaking us out. When we got there, our neighbour locked herself in a room with the girl and told us to wait outside. I don't know what happened, but after a couple of hours, our friend and neighbour came out. She was very tired and didn't remember anything from the point that we were playing with the board. My neighbour told us to not play with what we cannot control. I'm not really sure what happened in that room but I'm glad that my friend was okay. The bit that gets to me the most though, is how she was saying all these things about me and my friend that she didn't know, that no one knew. It terrifies me to this day. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I would just like to say thank you to everyone who assisted with sending me designs and ideas for the merch. They are all very much appreciated. And to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon, thank you guys. It means the world to me. If you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to smash that like button and subscribe, as you won't want to miss what I have in store for you next. Which incidentally, you can help decide on from now on, if you become a patron. Also, what do you guys think of the new YouTube? I'm still making my mind up, but I am a bit upset that they're investing their time and energy in rebranding themselves arbitrarily instead of fixing the monetization issues, as it affects so many of us. But anyway, you can't win them all I suppose. Remember that you can submit your scary or paranormal story to my new official reddit page, or send it over to my email, both of which can be found in the description. And feel free to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at The Mortis Media, for sneak peeks into what goes on behind the scenes. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.